So welcome back for our final session of uh, today's Agile 100 online conference. Um, Zuzi and I are both super happy to have Judy here with us. We have a bit of history with Judy. Um, Zuzi was the host of the Global Scrum Gathering in 2015 in Prague, and Judy and I became CSTs on that, in that gathering, actually with an, a, another colleague of ours, Anu, and Anu was one of our speakers that I think the first or second Agile 100, I don't, re I don't really remember. So it's great to see you here with us, Judy. Um, you can do a proper introduction yourself. I'm handing over to you, Judy. Thanks for being here. All right. Well, thank you guys for having me. I'm um, super happy to be here with all of you um, during the break. So Rob and Zuzi and I were talking about how much we miss gatherings and seeing all of you together and getting to to chat amongst colleagues. So this is uh, this is the next best best thing. So I'm happy to happy to be here. Um, as Sarab said, I am a certified Scrum trainer. Um, I am in Indiana in the USA. My, uh, my background is actually in mathematics and computer science. I was a software engineer by, uh, for most of my career and, um, and then made a transition to Agile, I'm going to say right around 2000, 2001. So right when the Agile movement was, was gaining um, some momentum. And so, uh, so I've been working with Agile teams uh, for almost two decades now. Um, and also, I don't know if it's been mentioned yet here today, but the uh, 20th anniversary of the Agile Manifesto is going to be next, uh, next year in 2021. And also the 20th um, anniversary of the Scrum Alliance being formed in 2021. So two decades of agility. So thank you guys again for having me. I wanted to spend some time with you guys today talking about servant leadership or what I affectionately call humble leadership because it's such a different approach to leadership than most of us have probably grown up with in our career um, and been uh, familiar with and have had experience with. So I wanted to spend a little time talking about servant leadership uh, with you all today. So when you and maybe we can use the maybe we can use the chat uh, for a moment if you guys would uh, would be willing. Um, when you think of the term leadership, what comes to mind? So just let's throw some things into the chat. What kind of um, what kind of terms come to mind when you think of the term leadership? Gardener, I like that one. Inspiration, pioneer. Inspire. Stody teller. I'm not sure what that means, but that sounds interesting. Looking ahead, custodian. Oh, storyteller, maybe. I <laughs> said Stody. I'm like, wait a minute, maybe that's something I don't understand. <laughs> um, being a role model, um, opening doors, right? These are all the terms. Thank you guys for that. These are all of the terms that come to mind uh, when we think of this idea of leadership. Um, someone to follow. There's another one, right? But we don't tend to think of the terms like uh, service or serving or servant, right? And so those are the uh, those are the terms that I would like to uh, to 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 go into with you uh, this afternoon or this morning or wherever you guys happen to be in the world. Um, there are really two types of leadership that um, that we can kind of categorize. And one is this idea of, uh, of a uh, more of a power leadership style. And then we have this uh, servant first leadership. So a leader first versus a servant first. Um, leader first 
let's focus on that one first, because that's one one most of us are probably familiar with. This is like what we refer to as a power stance or a power leadership style. It really derives from a very hierarchical organizational um, pyramid, right, where you have this leader at the top. And power leaders or leader first, a leader first stance is really about getting people to do things, right? Getting people to do things. And it's really about grabbing power for themselves. Conversely, this servant first leadership style is really uh, coming from a place of service, right? Of, of wanting to serve others. Uh, and in this kind of servant, servant first style, hierarchy in the organization doesn't actually matter because really anyone in, um, in an organization or even in a community can be of service to another person in that organization or community. And so this servant first mentality is really about helping people do things, right? Rather than about grabbing power, it's about giving power to others. So it's a very different leadership style. Some of the problems with a power leadership style are it really focuses on um, the uh, attainment of the power, not about necessarily using it wisely. Uh, and it defines success in terms of who has the most power. And so it sets up this uh, dynamic of conflict amongst groups and organizations because everybody's kind of jockeying for power in that type of leadership stance. So if you think about uh, history, for example, and you think about characters like Macbeth, right? Shakespearean character who, you know, whose ambition became so strong that he abandoned all of his moral constraints, right? And his life became one about murder and betrayal and leading from afar, right? So this is this power leadership stance. Um, Machiavelli is another uh, character from history that really embodies this power leadership stance. He, um, he has some interesting quotes that kind of encapsulate you know, what he called political realism. And, and one of them is, and I'll read it for you. He said, since so many people are not good, it is necessary for a prince who wishes to maintain himself to learn how not to be good, right? So this is, the, this is that mindset of that power leadership. So these types of leaders don't actually care about meeting human needs. They're really more interested in their own uh, focus of obtaining power. On the other hand, these servant leaders ask things like, what do people need and how can I help them get it? Or what does my organization need and how can I help them get it, right? So it's a very, very, very different um, mindset. Um, and so back to, you know, thinking about historical figures and, and who embodies uh, who embodies this type of leadership style, you know, in, in, um, in, in US history, George Washington, right, is a great example of someone who really was about public service. Um, they actually wanted him to be king back in uh, US history, and uh, he, he didn't want to be king. And in fact, he was actually willing to step down from public service when he felt he had done everything he could for his country and give someone else a turn. So that's really the kind of thing we're talking about when we look at um, this servant leadership style. So hopefully you're starting to get a little bit of sense about like how these two are very different from each other. And I love this quote um, from Albert Einstein. And he says, you know, the high destiny of individuals is to serve rather than to rule. So when, when, you, when you think of leadership and you think of, um, you know, people in the public eye, you know, who generally comes to mind, especially when you're thinking of this servant leadership style. So I have a couple of examples that, that I think of personally. 
One is Elon Musk. Um, and I love this quote from Elon Musk. He says, I think it is possible for ordinary people to choose to be extraordinary. Um, and Elon Musk is one of those controversial figures, right? You can maybe say he takes more of a power stance or, or more of a servant stance. But when you read about Elon Musk, there's stories about, um, about him actually, for example, sleeping on the production floor at Tesla during the Model S production, just to make sure you know, he was there uh, in case he was needed. Um, Steve Jobs, one of uh, one of you know one of the great late, great leaders of our time. Uh, this quote, I use this quote actually a lot in my uh, certified Scrum Master classes. I think it really captures um, empowered teams and the the point of empowering teams to make decisions. He says it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. Right. I think that's incredibly powerful when it comes to, you know, where decision making uh, really needs to happen, especially as it relates to how to do the work. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, also, when you think about uh, when you think about royalty, you think about, uh, you know, the royal family, for example, in the UK, you think maybe, you know, these are people who are used to being served. Um, and, and I love this quote from Kate Middleton, and she says, you know, I really hope I can make a difference even in the smallest way. I'm looking forward to helping as much as I can. This is a very servant mindset, right, of coming from that place of service. So let's talk about this uh, idea of servant leadership or this term uh, servant leadership. Um, before we dive into some of the details of servant leadership, I actually want to show you a quick video. Um, this video was produced, it's about three minutes, three minute video. Um, it was produced by um, a gentleman named Sam Walker. Sam Walker wrote a book called The Captain Class. And the, the book is about the greatest sports teams of all time in the world, the greatest sports teams in all history. And what he did was he wanted to look at, um, is there a commonality that existed amongst these great sports teams that made them so amazing, right? And so um, based on the name of the book, you could probably guess what he, what he learned in his research was that these great sports teams in history all had the same kind of captain. So I wanted to show you this video because in this video, Sam Walker describes the six most underappreciated captains in sports history. And I think it'll give you a little bit of a flavor of what servant leadership looks like. So take a listen. And so Rob, can you just give me the thumbs up that you can hear the video? Okay, cool. Babe Ruth, Pele, Michael Jordan. Okay. All three are sports superstars. But is an iconic player really the key to creating a legendary team? In my book, The Captain Class, I found that many great sports teams didn't have a superstar. They didn't have loads of money. They didn't have great coaches or even a great strategy. The only thing they had in common was the same kind of captain. And these men and women were not what you would expect. They weren't charismatic stars. They kept a low profile and often did the grunt work. They played relentlessly, sometimes bent the rules, and always stood up for what they believed in. In fact, some of them were so far under the radar, you probably never heard of them. Here are the six most underappreciated captains in sports history. The New York Yankees have won 27 world championships. They're the most glamorous franchise in American sports. But only one Yankee leader won the World Series five times in a row. Who was this motivational genius? Was it Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Derek Jeter? Nope, it was a stumpy little catcher named Yogi Berra. Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls are the greatest NBA team of all time, right? Hold on a minute. Bill Russell's Boston Celtics won almost twice as many championships 
and Tim Duncan's San Antonio Spurs made the playoffs for 19 straight seasons and won five. The Bulls can't match either of those achievements. While Duncan and Russell might have been lesser players, they were more effective leaders than his Airness. The 1999 U.S. women's soccer team won the World Cup behind unforgettable stars like Mia Hamm and Brandi Chastain. So which one of them was the captain? That's a trick question. It was neither. The captain of that team was a water-carrying, publicity-shy defender named Carla Overbeck. If Tom Brady's New England Patriots win another Super Bowl, it will be fair to call them one of the two best NFL teams of all time. But only one team, the Pittsburgh Steelers, has ever won four Super Bowls in six seasons. And the leader of that team was another guy who hated attention, the middle linebacker and defensive captain, Jack Lambert. Barcelona was the most dazzling soccer team of all time. They dominated the world behind the superstar Leo Messi and their manager Pep Guardiola. But the team's peak years corresponded to the arrival and departure of one player, a shaggy-haired, non-superstar defender and captain of the team, Carlos Puyol. Okay, last one. When you think of Brazil's great soccer dynasty that won back-to-back -back World Cups, the first person you think of is Pelé. But guess what? Pele was never the captain. That job went to another unheralded defender, a guy named Hilderaldo Bellini, who never scored a goal in his entire time with the team. Do you see a pattern here? The point is this. Next time you're picking a leader for your team, remember that the right choice may not be the obvious one. So, so Bill Russell, he mentions Bill Russell in this video. He was the captain for the Celtics back in the late 60s, probably actually 50s to late 60s. When Bill Russell was the captain for the Boston Celtics, he was kind of thought to be somewhat of a, of a jerk. Um, this is a guy who would not sign um, autographs for fans. He wouldn't do media interviews. When he retired from the Celtics, he uh, didn't show up for the retirement ceremony. Um, when he, uh, at some point, he was actually even inducted into the, the Basketball Hall of Fame, didn't show up for that ceremony either. Uh, when Bill Russell uh, got to be uh, in his 70s, well, actually, when he when he retired from basketball, he became a civil rights activist. And when he got to be somewhere in his 70s, the New York Times interviewed him for his role in civil rights activism. And, and the journalist who had been interviewing him asked him the question that people had been wondering for decades. He said, Bill Russell, you were inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame why didn't you bother to show up for the ceremony? And his answer was surprising to everybody. He said, I wasn't about to accept an individual accolade for something that we achieved as a team, right? Which, by the way, kind of explained all of his behavior, why he wouldn't sign autographs, why he wouldn't go to these award ceremonies, because he wasn't about to be individually at, um, uh, praised for a, 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 team, uh, a team achievement. Carla Overbeck, I like to talk about her because she's a Tar Heel. She went to the University of North Carolina, which is, by the way, my alma mater. She was the captain for the uh, 1999 Women's World Cup soccer team. Uh, she, he called her a publicity shy water carrying defender in the video. And so Carla Overbeck was literally the woman that would run. She was at, she would actually run water out to her teammates. On, on the field whenever they were playing. Um, and in fact, uh, whenever they got to a hotel, wherever they were playing a game around the world, um, Carla Overbeck would literally personally deliver all of her teammates' bags to their room. And when they won the World Cup in 1999, they were thrown like a big ticker tape parade in New York City, and Carla Overbeck was back in Raleigh, North Carolina, doing her laundry. And they said, "You know, why why weren't you why weren't you there?" And she said, "I didn't need all the pomp and circumstance. I'm just happy my team won." 
So hopefully you're starting to get a little bit of a picture about what servant leadership looks like. It's incredibly humble, right? It's not the, the shiny in your face. Babe Ruth. Oh, no, nope, we don't want to watch that again. Uh, it's not the shiny in your face. Look at me. I'm in charge. It's, it's the person who's behind the scenes doing the grunt work, right? Making sure that the people that are doing the work have what they need to do their job, right? So that's kind of servant leadership in a nutshell. Um, as we were mentioning earlier, servant leadership as a concept is not a new idea. I've given you some examples of historical figures like George Washington, right? Who really embodied uh, servant leadership. The term servant leadership wasn't coined until 1970 when a gentleman by the name of Robert Greenleaf um, published a pivotal paper on servant leadership that was titled The Servant as Leader. In this paper, and this is where this term servant leadership was coined, this paper really changed the way we thought about leadership, right? Um, and he, in this paper, this is his definition of servant servant leadership. So I'll give you a second to kind of look through that. But in essence, he, he really is defining servant leadership as coming from a place of, of service, right? It's tapping into people's natural to desire to want to serve others. Um, and so in the paper, he describes a few characteristics of servant leadership. Um, namely that servant leaders focus on building a foundation of trust, that servant leaders stimulate empowerment and transparency. Some of these things may seem, sound very familiar to you, those of you that have uh, been working in, in uh, Agile for a while. Um, they encourage collaborative agree uh, engagements. They're empathetic and they, and they um, remove roadblocks um, and are able to truly be present and listen to what is going on. They show, uh, they show caring and ethical behavior and putting other needs, uh, others' needs before their own. And they are humble, knowledgeable, positive, social, and situationally aware. So these are all the characteristics uh, that Greenleaf defines in, in the paper. Um, quick fun fact, Robert Greenleaf actually attended Rose Holman Institute of Technology, which is uh, uh, actually here in the state of Indiana in the US. And it is where my daughter and son-in-law graduated from as well. Um, Okay, so also in this paper on servant leadership, and by the way, this, uh, this institute, I should mention, let me go back a second. Um, there, you can go online and search for the Center for Servant Leadership. So these are, this is a, uh, this institute is all things servant leadership. The, uh, the original papers on servant leadership are out there. There's lots of um, articles and books. So it's a great place to go to get more information on servant leadership, especially as Robert Greenleaf defined it. So I just wanted to mention that. So in, uh, in his paper, uh, he mentioned the seven key practices of servant leadership. And I wanted to run through these with you just to get an idea of what this really, uh, really looks like. So um, let's see, the first, the first key practice of servant leadership is, is self-awareness, right? And self-awareness is all about uh, not only understanding your strengths and weaknesses, right? And being very, uh, being very real about your own strengths and weaknesses, but also being knowledgeable about how, um, how your body language, your facial expressions, how those things affect those around you, especially when you're perceived as a leader in the group, right? Typically, if you're perceived as a leader, then lots of eyes are on you. And so being very aware of your body language, your facial expressions, and how those are affecting, you know, the dynamics of the group that you're in, that's all part of self-awareness. 
also how small words of criticism can be perceived and have an impact on uh, on those around you. And conversely, even how you know words of praise can can be an impact as well. Um, so all of that falls under the category of self-awareness, but self-awareness takes self-reflection, right? And so uh, it really it really requires us as leaders to to pause and reflect on how are we doing as a leader? How 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 am I how am I being perceived? how what feedback am i getting and right and really being able to take a good hard look at that um, when we think about where this shows up um, in in scrum specifically so retrospectives right are one really important way where the whole not just uh the scrum master right can be a servant leader in scrum but really the whole team can be in a position to serve others and this self-awareness the retrospective is this moment of self-awareness for the entire team right this is the moment where we get to pause and and take a look at you know really uh, realistically, how are things going and how can we improve, not only as individuals, but, you know, as a team together. The second key practice of servant leadership is listening. And this one's kind of, I think, a little bit interesting because, uh, because listening is one of those things that I think we take for granted and also we think we can do and do other stuff at the same time right so probably many of you have had this experience where somebody's typing do, 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 right and saying go ahead i'm listening yeah just yeah yeah i'm listening go ahead right well that's not really listening that your brains don't your brains don't work like that in terms of processing multiple things at the same time Many of us have said, and I've said it myself, I'm a great multitasker. I have news for all of us. We're not great multitaskers, right? And so listening really requires focused attention. Um, if you look at uh, listening paradigms or listening criteria, you can kind of put them into these three categories of listening. Um, Level one listening is what is what is described here on this slide, right? That most people uh, are listening with the intent of what do I get to say next? That's what we refer to as level one listening. It's really thinking about what's going on inside your own head versus what's going on in the room that you're in. Level two listening is like laser focused. It is, I am, you know, I am looking at Zuzi and I am laser focused on what Zuzi is saying to me and I am very present with her, right? And so you can tell when people are, are in level two listening because, you know, their body language tells you that, right? They're, they're looking at you, they're shaking their heads, they're, they're maybe even leaning in. So, Level two listening is easy to spot, right? Through body language and facial expressions. Level three listening is really global, okay? And, and especially as trainers, we have to do a lot of level three listening in our classrooms because it requires us really to listen to the energy in the room. And so that's level three listening. It's gauging everyone's energy and kind of noting when people are, you know, dropping their energy level and when we have to shift gears. So level three is really more uh, global. And so servant leaders listen at level two and level three, okay? Level one is what are, I think, our typical uh, stances, but it's something, again, to be self-aware about, you know, when am I only listening to what's going on in my head? Um, you guys have all seen this agile principle, right? The most efficient and effective method of conveying information. We've all seen this face-to-face -face conversation. We've had a little struggle with face-to-face -face conversation lately, right? Because of, of COVID and our needs to, uh, to, to shift to, um, to virtual type learning like we're doing here. Um, but 
it doesn't change the fact that um, body language and facial expressions are about 55% of the way we communicate. And so even in this, you know, even in this uh, era that we're in right now, if the best we can do is turn on our camera and actually get to see each other that way, even if it's just from here up, it's better than not doing it. Right, and so that really enables listening. And by the way, I wanna say one other quick thing about listening, observation is really part of listening as well, right? So making good observations um, and then along with observations is asking good questions. Um, the third key practice of uh, servant leadership is what's referred to as changing the pyramid. And this is all about that organizational hierarchy that we talked about before, where this is on the left side of the screen is where we have our very traditional hierarchy of, uh, and this is probably the way most of your organizations are, are organized, where we have the CEO at the top and then our middle managers and then the people that are doing the work usually sit at the bottom of the pyramid. And that kind of organizational uh, structure, typically everybody's kind of looking up, trying to please the person above them, right? Um, because those are the people that um, determine their salary structures or their bonuses, right? And so everybody's kind of looking up and trying to get the person um, above them to be happy. And in that kind of structure, if everybody's looking upward, who's looking out for the customer, right? So servant leader organizations, not just one person in the organization says servant, I'm a servant leader, but the organization has said, we are a servant leader organization, looks much different, right? And this is what we mean by changing the pyramid. The leadership now functions as a team. Right, And their job becomes one of making sure that the people that are doing the work are, are growing and learning and happy, right? And empowered to do the work that they've been uh, hired to do. Um, if research shows that the number one intrinsic motivator of knowledge workers is choice, right? A choice of how to do the work. And by changing that pyramid and by changing the job of leadership to become one of ensuring that the people that are doing the work are, have the knowledge, have the tools, have the skills to do the job, then that decision making easily gets pushed to, to those that are doing, uh, doing the work. In those types of uh, environments, what naturally happens when employees are growing and learning and happy, they naturally serve their customers. And in a little bit, I'm gonna um, share with you some organizations that have said we are servant leader organizations. Um, I'm gonna skip through this slide in a minute because I wanna get through the rest of these um, key practices. Um, the next key practice, developing, uh, developing your colleagues. Again, it goes to that um, empowerment, right? And making sure that, that the people, rather than telling the people uh, that are doing the work how to do the work, giving them the tools to figure it out themselves. Um, part of developing your colleagues is also creating a, an environment where failure is okay, right? And I think a lot of times organizations have a hard time with this idea of failure. But in general, we are, we are solving complex problems, right? And so as you solve complex problems, failure has got to be part of the equation and creating an environment where, you know, failure is okay, failure happens sooner rather than later, and, and we have this environment where we learn from that failure, that all goes in, that all becomes part of the learning that we do uh, as an organization and as a team. Okay. Um, and I'm going to skip through these because I'm sure you guys have seen these. There's my Tar Heels, by the way. Um, and so the next key practice of servant leadership is coaching, not controlling. Um, 
we I, we tend to use this word coach a lot. Uh, and some folks will use this term coach to, uh, or they'll use it synonymously with consultant or um, directive, but coaching in general is not, uh, is not directive, it is not controlling. Coaching is really about asking really good questions. Uh, it is about helping, um, helping uh, those that are being coached to kind of discover their own their own strengths and their own abilities to solve problems, and so servant leaders are are coaches, right? They really help the the people that they're that they're leading kind of dig into their own natural abilities uh, to solve problems and work together. So, you know, where does coaching happen in Scrum? You know, I have some examples up here. You know, these are kind of the obvious places, but really anywhere, right? And, and normally in Scrum, we look for the Scrum Master to, we assign that role of coach to the Scrum Master. Um, but really, again, in a servant leader organization, anyone can be in a position you know, to coach someone else, right? We all have unique abilities. Um, and, and so that coaching can really come from, from anywhere. Um, unleashing, uh, unleashing the energy and intelligence of others, right? This is all about creating cultures of, of, of trust. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, the number one intrinsic motivator when you look at when you look at knowledge workers and you look at research about what motivates knowledge workers. So if you haven't heard that phrase before knowledge workers, knowledge workers are folks that use their their brains for uh, to do their job right and and research shows that uh, that that number one motivator is choice. It's autonomy of, of how to do the work. Um, and I'm going to read this quote and it says, research shows that people who are intrinsically motivated are more productive, more committed, more innovative, and less likely to burn out. Um, there's a book called The Leadership Challenge. And, and in that book, they, they describe that external motivation is more likely to create conditions of compliance or defiance. Self-motivation uh, self <laughs> produces far superior results, right? So this is always about pushing that decision-making um, to the person, to the people that are actually doing the work. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip through that. The last key practice of uh, of servant leadership is foresight, and this is uh, this is really about you know having a vision, being able to kind of uh, of look of look looking forward and um, perceiving the significance of events before they actually happen. So I'll give you a quick example. And this example comes from a book called Good to, the Gr Good to Great by Jim Collins. Um, and in the book, Good to Great, Jim Collins talks about um, two, uh, two supermarket chains in the United States back in the, um, back in the, I'm gonna say 90s to early 2000s. Um, Kroger is a very large supermarket chain here in the U.S. And um, also uh, prior to that, there was another supermarket chain called uh, AMP, which stood for Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, actually. Um, both organizations kind of saw the end of the very traditional grocery store. But it was Kroger who had the foresight to try some experiments, right? And so they did some experiments with what they called a superstore, where it wasn't just about groceries, but it was about bringing other goods in as well, like housewares and maybe even some clothing. And so they did this experiment, and not only did that was the experiment successful, they literally changed every single one of their stores 
um, over to this superstore uh, concept. Kroger is still one of the number one uh, grocery stores here in the US. AMP doesn't exist anymore, right? So this foresight, uh, being able to kind of look forward and, and predict events is, is also uh, a key practice. So those are the those seven key practices of servant leadership. In the, I want to just take. Um, I'm going to flip through those really quick. Uh, I want to just take two minutes and then just give you some examples of organizations that have said we are servant leader organizations, and then I'll I'll wrap up my talk. Um, so. In the United States, these uh, companies, probably uh, some of you have had experience with these organizations as customers. These are all, these are all companies, Nordstrom, Chick-fil-A, Southwest Airlines, Disney. These are all companies that have said, we are servant leader organizations. Not just one person is a servant leader, but the entire organization has structured themselves around servant leadership. Um, for example, if you go into any Nordstrom and uh, at any time uh, with anything, you could have bought it 10 years ago, every single cashier at Nordstrom is empowered to make your experience at Nordstrom frictionless. No one ever has to say, you know what, let me go get a manager and see what we're gonna do, right? They, they are empowered to make that choice and they are happy to do it, right? To make your experience perfect. Same is true at Disney, by the way, probably many of you have been to Disney. Every single, they don't even call their employees employees. They call them cast members at Disney. Every single uh, cast member at Disney is empowered with a budget at their disposal to make your experience um, uh, uh, perfect at Disney. You know, you can go up to any cast member at any Disney park and with a problem and they have the ability to fix it for you. So these are organizations that have adopted servant leadership as an organizational practice. And so I wanted to just leave you with a few examples. Um, and I want to leave you with just one small inquiry. Um, is servant leadership always the right practice? Or is there room for other leadership styles as well? So just something to ponder uh, as, you, as you finish your day here at Agile 100. So thank you guys very much. All right. <clears throat> thank you so much, Judy. If you don't mind, yes, I was just going to say, unshare your presentation <laughs> so that everyone can see you um, in a larger scale. All right. Thank you so much. This was really interesting. We already have a few questions coming in. And I think one of the questions you just answered, it was from Ingrid, whether you have some examples of comp companies with servant leadership pyramids. And yeah. um, I, I already mentioned uh, Jim Collins's book and uh, Michele Zanini's book on humanocracy, that there are a lot of examples in there. And you just shared four companies that do operate in that kind of a management model or leadership model. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I want to give you I want to give you just a quick example just to add to that I have Southwest Airlines on there, you know, back when um, so Rob and Zuzi back when we were traveling all the time getting on an airplane every what did you guys do when you when 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 you got on an airplane and you sat down in your seat and the flight attendants started doing the security briefings what did you guys what did you guys do while you were listening to security briefing. Watching movies. Yeah, exactly, right? Me too. I'd be like texting my husband or uh, shopping on Amazon, right? If you get on a Southwest Airlines flight, and so here in the US, um, the, every, uh, those of you that are uh, from the US here, you know what I mean. You get on a Southwest Airlines flight, those flight attendants have a good time sharing the security briefing. They're dancing, they're singing, they're telling jokes, right? And because they're having a good time, I'm listening, right? And it's because those flight attendants have been empowered to deliver that information any way they want, right? That's the servant leader organization. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 no problem. No I get problem. excited I about a, that. It's a great example <laughs> of like empowering people. And one interesting thing I just read about this a few days ago. So 
Does anyone know what South, uh, Southwest Airlines uh, stock ticker name is? No. What is in it? Most, in most cases, it has something to do with the company name, right? It's a, so Tesla is, for, for example, TSL. Southwest yeah. Airlines is L-U-V, love. Oh, love, so nothing to yeah. Do with the company name, but it's about their mission, right? They bring love to their work, love to the people that they serve and so on and so forth. So it, you even see that in, in these little things, right? Which other than investors, nobody notices, but their employees know because all of their employees are also considered as investors in the company. So <laughs> let's go to some of the questions as we're, as we're running out of time. Um, okay. Mark had asked early on, what if leaders start looking more at body language? That was, I think, at one point that you were talking about this, not always in a positive sense and not listening to the content. What if people are pushed to always have a smiley face? What, so say the question again, what if, what if leader, I'm sorry, I missed the first part. What if so, leaders are. So start looking more at the body language as you had mentioned this, right? Yeah. Not always, not always in a positive sense and not listening actually to the content, to what people are saying. And yeah. what if people are then pushed to always have a smiley face? Yeah, well, that's, you know, that, that actually, I think really describes a uh, power power leadership style organizations, right? Because in those types of organizations, employees are, um, are kind of pushed to always have a smiley face, right? They see their boss and, they're, and the boss is like, well, how is everything going? What'd you do for me today? And they're like, things are going great, boss, right? Like, it's, like, it's been a good day. I've gotten a lot of stuff done. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's not the truth. Right. But, but this is the person who, you know, maybe writes my performance appraisal. And, um, this is the person who determines my salary. And so I'm going to put a happy face on and, uh, I'm going to tell him what he wants to hear. Right. And that's what tends to happen in those types of, uh, organizations. I actually was just, um, working with an organization that has a very structured power leadership style and they were talking about how the boss comes to their retrospectives and uh and they said that nobody can be honest in the retrospective because the boss is the boss is in the room right and the boss is the one who determines their salary right and so that's that power that's the effect of a power leadership style right in a servant leadership style, people don't really even tend to realize who the, the boss is, right? My, um, my daughter, uh, I'm at her house right now. She, uh, she's a software developer on her scrum team and her organization is a medium sized corporation, totally a servant leader uh, company. They are accountable to each other. They're accountable to their, to their team. Um, when they are incentivized, they're incentivized as a team. Uh, and when they get a bonus, the bonus goes to the team. And uh, the team figures out how to divvy that up. That's a very, you know, that's a style of leadership that, you know, most of us probably have never experienced before. It's really, really different. Um, Body language has a way of betraying us. And I know you asked about body language, but it really does have a way of betraying, you know, what we're thinking and what we're feeling. Because, you know, if I was talking to you, so Rob, and I was like, kind of like, um, yeah, 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 that sounds good. That sounds good, right? That, you know, I'm not listening, right? You know, I'm not listening. I'm really just trying to run out the door. So we have to be, especially as servant leaders, we have to be really conscious of that body language and that level two and three listening, because it makes a difference. It, it's an impact to those around us for sure. Yeah. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I'm okay, seeing a th great. thumbs up from Mark. So nice. Amir is asking, how can we preserve the command and control concept in servant leadership to support both the enterprise structure and an agile approach? Maybe we need to add to this question, do we at all need to preserve the community? Yeah, that's the question, isn't it? If this is, it's funny, this is a question. So my husband, so Rob, you know, my husband is a surgeon and uh, 
he and I have this conversation all the time. Like, is there, and this is why I wanted to leave you all with this inquiry is like, is there a place for power leadership and is there a place for command and control or should it always be servant leadership? And, uh, you know, if my husband were here, he would argue that, you know, in the operating room, it's got, he's not going to be like, oh, what can I do for you guys today? You know, he, he's, there's a life on the line, there's a life on the table. And so uh, he's in charge and it's very much command and control in the operating room. And so there probably are circumstances like that where maybe command and control is, is, is more appropriate. Um, some would say in the military. Right, but there's plenty of examples of military figures. There's a great book uh, by David Marquette about uh, <laughs> turn the ship around about um, leading with intent, and uh, and so you know some would say maybe certain leadership is is appropriate in the military. So it's an interesting it's an interesting question I think to ponder. Yeah, I mean I spent some some fair amount of time in operating rooms myself. And, um, and I think, so when I saw the David Marquette video, I was like, yeah, we could use the same concepts in medicine because yeah. as long as people have the competence and a lot of people in the medical field have the competence, independent from whether they're nurses or doctors, et cetera, and the clarity of where you want to take things, they do take a lot of autonomous decisions, right? You, uh -huh. And you want them to do that. Now, right. do you have emergencies sometimes? Yes. But even in an emergency, you can lead very differently. And sometimes you take the, you take the lead as, as the most senior person. And right. sometimes you delegate the lead to someone else, right? And I think whenever you see that you're taking the lead more, more and more often, this might be a sign that you haven't spent enough time on your people building those capabilities, building those competencies. And that's just not a sustainable approach, not for you, not for them, not for the hospital, and not for the patients. Right? I totally agree. And I think this is, yeah. the, this is the agility that comes into this play, right? You, you can play yeah. different, different, uh, yeah, different, you can do it in a different way, but you need to get there first as a leader. Yeah, I, I, totally, I totally agree. This would be a great talk for gathering. Yeah, sure. <laughs> maybe I can give that talk with your husband together. <laughs> yeah, I think that sounds great. I think that's a perfect talk. We should put that together because yeah. it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting idea, right? About where servant leadership uh, really comes into play in healthcare. Now, he would argue that in his clinic, he definitely adopts more of a, you know, when he's in his office and in his clinic, he definitely adopts more of a servant leadership style because they work definitely as a team. So really, yeah, I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah. And there's a great book about this actually. It's called, I think, Management Lessons from Mayo Clinic, which is one of the leading clinics in the world. And they do cover, they, I, I don't remember if they use the term servant leadership, but there are a lot of the same principles in there. Yeah. Uh, like empowering the different people independent from their level of seniority and academic background and how you get much better patient outcomes, which is ultimately what, what we want to achieve in a, in a exactly. medical system. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, Judy, one last question, and that's going to be sure. a short one. You referred okay. to a book regarding autonomy and choice. And someone was asking what that book title war was. Um, let me go back and I, it is called the Leadership Challenge. The Leadership Challenge. All right. The Leadership we'll Challenge. Sure. The authors are, I don't know how to say this, Kuzes, K-O-U-Z-E-S and Posner, P-O-S-N-E-R. Okay. We'll find it and then we put it in the, in the Slack channel. The okay. Leadership Challenge. All right, Judy. Thank you so much for being hey, with us today. Hey, it is my pleasure. And sharing your insights on the topic of leadership with us. Um, we were super amazed to host you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah. Appreciate being invited.